Hi, so as I mentioned at the end of the last video, I'm going to be talking about actually locating um, these observational studies and trials that I talked about in the previous video. So just as a quick review, um, I'm going to be focusing on this lower part of the uh, pyramid today. Um, I'm going to be talking about finding those case series, case control, cohort studies, and uh, randomized control trials. And in the upcoming videos, I'll talk about finding systematic reviews and guidelines. In addition to taking a look at PubMed and finding these study types, I'm also going to talk briefly about clinicaltrials.gov, which is another resource for information. So going back to the scenario that we looked at last week with Francine, who's concerned about um, falling and is asking about whether or not vitamin D plus calcium can help prevent falls. And this is our PICO. And this is our actual PICO question. So does vitamin D with calcium prevent injuries from falls among elderly female patients? Let's go find some evidence to try and answer this question. PubMed is going to be um, a really great resource for finding all of this all of these types of research studies. Um, as is mentioned, it is one of the largest biomedical databases in the world. It's a really good repository. All right, so this chart is uh, kind of breaking down uh, the different types of studies. So you can have descriptive versus analytical. And in the first side on descriptive, we have that bottom of the evidence-based pyramid. We have those case reports and case series, um, which is what we're going to focus on first, finding those. In PubMed, um, they actually have an article type filter for case reports and case series. Um, so that makes it relatively easy to uh, filter um, out your results. So to find the case series and case reports, I'm going to start again at the library homepage and I'm going to just go straight to PubMed. So I'm going to click this PubMed at USC link um, that's located right here. All right, so my clinical question is, does vitamin D plus calcium prevent accidental falls in elderly females. So there are parts of that that make better search terms than others. For example, I tend to leave out things like ethnicity or age or gender or sex um, in my searches because I can always filter those out later. So I'm actually going to focus on vitamin D, calcium, and accidental falls. So I have my list of results here and I have about 286 results. and. First, I want to narrow this down to case series or case reports. And I can actually do that using these article type filters over here on the left side. To actually see the full range of article type filters, I'm gonna click customize. And that's gonna open up that menu and I can select case reports. And I can scroll down too just to take a look at what other filters um, are also available. But I'm just gonna click show now I have those case reports, I click case reports, and I have nine different results that show up. I can scroll through these and find the piece of evidence that I am interested in. So on the analytical side, you have observational studies, and this includes case control studies and cohort studies. And if we head over to PubMed and try and find those case control studies and cohort studies, rather than having article type filters, but like we saw with the case series. Um, you actually have to use mesh terms um, for this. This will be a little brief review on finding mesh terms. So sticking with that same search that I did earlier with vitamin D, calcium, and accidental falls, now I'm actually looking for cohort studies. So I'm going to click this down menu next to the search box. Um, I've searched for mesh recently um, on this on PubMed, so that's why it shows up there. But this is just an alphabetical list, and I can scroll down and find mesh. So I'm going to select mesh. I'm going to clear out the search box, and I'm going to type in cohort studies. Um, and so that is actually the mesh term. So it takes me straight to that mesh record where I can get information about the definition for this term. Um, these are subheadings. I could select some of those if I really want to target my search. And if I scroll down on the page, then I can actually look at the mesh hierarchy. So these are the trees that cohort studies are part of, because remember mesh is hierarchical. So there are broader terms and there are 
are in narrower terms. Um, in this particular case, cohort studies falls under epidemiological studies, but it also includes things like follow-up studies, longitudinal studies, uh, perspective and retrospective studies. And when I searched for cohort studies as a mesh term, it will include um, searches for these mesh terms as well. Just a quick review into uh, the mesh terms and mesh term page. So to actually search for it in PubMed, I'm just gonna click add to search builder over here on the right side and then click search PubMed um, to do that mesh search. From here, I love to use the um, advanced search page. So I have the study or the search that I did previously right here. So if I wanna combine my vitamin D, calcium, and accidental fall search, I can do that here by clicking add. So it's added to the search box here, and then I can add the cohort studies um, mesh search and click search. That gives me 38 results, um, and of those 38 results, I can go and take a look at these different cohort studies and see what's there. And then lastly, in our study chart, when you split out the analytical, in addition to observational, you can have experimental studies, and this is going to include our randomized control trials. And like the case series and case reports, there is an article type filter for randomized control trials, so you can use that filter to, to narrow down your results in PubMed. So again, coming back to the same PubMed search, I'm gonna stick with the same keywords. Uh, this time I just wanna find randomized control trials. And like with case series and case reports, randomized control trial is also an article type filter. So you can come over here on the left, I click customize, and I can scroll down and find randomized control trial. I select that, click show. And now to actually turn on the filter, I'm just gonna click that again. Um, and that gives me 38 results. And again, I can scroll through these um, and see if there are any articles of interest. And so this one's a pilot cluster randomized control trial. So maybe that one is interesting. So one question that you might consider is, are all trials published? So when you're looking at PubMed, what you're looking at are articles that have been produced usually from completed trials. Um, but the reality is, is that not all trials are published and um, there can be a lot of different reasons for that. Maybe, you know, there were too many adverse events so the trial got canceled. Maybe, you know, there was whatever intervention they were looking at didn't show any kind of effect. And so there's a little bit of a balance here um, when you're looking at evidence-based medicine, where you're trying to find evidence about a particular treatment, the fact of the matter is, is when you go to PubMed, mostly what you're going to be seeing are positive results because that's what gets published. There's very little incentive to publish any kind of um, study that has negative results or no results. So there's something called publication bias, um, and that stems from these unreported results that uh, come from trials that, like I said, may have been shut down due to adverse reactions or, you know, they just didn't show any type of uh, positive result. Also, incomplete data and poorly designed tr trials um, can also affect what is published or what's available out there in the literature. And those types of um, issues, that's really when you need to uh, have your critical appraisal skills there so that when you're reading these studies, you can make these determinations as to uh, study design and other issues about the data. Um, there's also something called ghostwriting, which is similar to the ghostwriting that happens maybe with biographies or other types of um, publications. Um, but in this case, ghostwriting is used to refer to what can happen in uh, the pharmaceutical industry where people who didn't weren't necessarily involved in the study will uh, actually write up the article and that can just introduce um, some bias or some errors um, in terms of the reporting of results. Um, so again, this is where um, appraisal skills really come in handy. And I think that the other important part of understanding what this publication bias means is that you really cannot re rely on papers being accurate just because they've been through the peer review process. I think it's really easy to sort of fall into this trap of reading an article and kind of accepting the author's statements about the results because you're like, well, this went through the peer review process, but really these are, 
articles are about conversations um, that happen within the research community. And you always need to be critical and really try and interpret the data when you can on your own, because maybe your conclusions will be different. So as a way to get around this issue of publication bias in terms of trials that aren't com- that haven't been completed or um, have shut down for whatever reason. In 2007, there was the FDA Amendment Act, um, which requires that uh, drug and device trials must post or register with clinicaltrials.gov. And um, they must do that within one year of uh, completion of the study. This is a resource uh, where you can go and you can find current trials that are ongoing, um, trials that have finished but maybe don't have any publications. And while this is a good system in terms of its it's providing some information um, about, about these negative re- result trials or incomplete trials, um, it's not really perfect because Data only goes back to 2008 because the it, the law um, was enacted in 2007. Um, it only focuses on uh, drugs and treatments that are label use. And now this data is a little old at this point, but um, a study from 2012 shows that only one in five trials um, are actually compliant. So um, compliance could also be an could also be an issue. Um, but in addition to just finding uh, these negative result trials or, or other types of clinical trials, this can also be a, re- a good resource as a clinician if you have you know, a patient who is looking for some kind of experimental treatment. You can see if there are any ongoing uh, clinical trials available. This is a clinicaltrials.gov webpage. It's pretty basic. Uh, provides some background information about the actual database itself, like how many um, studies are actually included in here. In addition, because this is a registration site up here at the top, you can see where you can actually submit studies. And this provides information about why you should register, what the requirements are, and how to actually go through uh, that process. As a student, this is probably not something that you're going to have to worry about. This will be taken care of by your PI, but down the road, you never know. So really what we want to look at though here is the uh, search box uh, down here on the right hand side. I like to note that um, if you're a participant, there's actually a specific search for that. You can find a study to participate in or um, or you can just search all studies, which is what we're going to want to do. Um, and this is search is also already broken down into conditions, diseases, and then these other terms, which include things like drug names, uh, investigator names. Um, this NCT number is the clinical trial res- uh, registration number, which is similar to like the PMID that you see in PubMed for individual articles. So this is a much smaller database than PubMed. So I'm going to... Tr- try out this really simple search of vitamin D in falls because I'm not as concerned about um, the precision of my search because there's not a lot of records here. And I'm gonna click search all studies and I scroll down, I have 18 studies. There are a few different ways that I can look at my results. The default is this list view. Um, I can also look by topic, so it will pull out specific topics that cluster in um, my results. And I, so if there's a secondary uh, condition or something like that, I could focus in on on that. Like for example, uh, Parkinson's disease or some other something else that has that movement disorder. Um, I can look at these results scattered on a map. So if I am looking for a trial for one of my patients to participate in, I could look and see if there's anything that's close by right away. And then the search details tab provides details about how clinical trials is actually interpreting the keywords that I enter. So it doesn't use mesh like you have in PubMed, but it does use something similar and it does do that automatic term mapping that uh, PubMed does. So if I look at my search, up here towards the top, it could translate the keyword vitamin D into whatever their specific term is for vitamin D, and then um, it might interpret falls in um, in, a, in a particular way, which PubMed does as well. Actually, looking at my results, there are some filters over here on the side. So the first one here is study status. So I can narrow my search down that way. I can also uh, look by eligibility criteria, study type, study results, study phase. So there are a few different filters there on the side. With 18 results, I don't I don't think I need to be filtering anything. In the list results, it will give you the status. So in this case, this 
study is actually still recruiting um, participants and these three have already been completed. It gives me the title, what the actual conditions are that they're looking at and what interventions they're studying along with the location of the study. Right. And if I just scroll through these results list, I'll see a couple different status uh, designations, like unknown. This one is completed has results. Um, so I'm actually going to click on this one, even though they're looking specifically at Parkinson's disease. So on the main page, it gives me background information like who the sponsor is. This is that NCT number, so the identifier number that I mentioned earlier. And again, there are a couple ways to view the information here. So you have the full text view or the tabular view. Um, these provide you the same information, uh, just organized a little bit differently. So this is includes things like the study type, study design, title, their primary outcomes, the secondary outcomes, and also their enrollment period um, and eligibility information along with contact information. And if I scroll back up to the top, um, I can take a look at the study results here. Uh, this really can get into a lot of detail. So it's again providing that recruitment information and participant flow along with the different reporting groups and how they're and um, how they're labeling them. And then you can get the baseline measurements and then you can get information about all of the different primary and secondary outcomes that they were measuring uh, in this clinical trial. So it can be um, a good resource for finding those trials that may not ever get published or may not have been published yet. All right, so I also wanted you to show you what it looks like when there is a publication that's associated with one of the clinical trial entries. Uh, in this particular case, I just happened to find this one that's cardiovascular disease population risk tool. And if I click on that study title, again, I have all that same information we saw in the previous record, um, and I can go and look at those study results. All right, and down here under more information, it shows the publications that are associated with this particular clinical trial. And um, in this particular case, they published a study protocol back in 2014. And the study protocol is a paper that can get published prior to uh, initiation of the clinical trial. And Publishing your study protocol ahead of initiating the trial is, promotes transparency in the research process. Um, if you remember back earlier, I was talking about publication bias and some of the negative outcomes that can come out of that. Um, there's the ghost writing, there's how it, results are interpreted, um, poorly designed studies. So publishing the study protocol can help address some of those issues because you're already putting out there that these are the outcomes that I'm going to measure, this is how I'm going to measure them, and then there can't be any manipulation once the trial is underway, or you can see what the manipulation is once the trial is underway. Um, so it's really actually an ethical uh, consideration whether or not you want to publish your study protocol. That is not a requirement or it's not mandated by any funders that I know of, but again, it's just about transparency and um, ethics in research. As of right now, this is the only publication that's associated with this clinical trial, but if I look further down into this information, I can see that the results were first posted and the last update was done in August of 2017, which was just a few months ago. So I wouldn't be surprised in any way if they are already working on the manuscript or have already finished their manuscript and um, are just going through that publication process. So in maybe six, eight months, I can come back here and find an additional citation underneath here that will have the study results. So I I've talked about locating the different study types in PubMed and showed you a little bit about clinicaltrials.gov. And as always, if you have questions, definitely let me know. And in our next video, I'm going to talk more in depth about systematic reviews and meta-analyses.